about it. Okay, we're going to get started now. Uh, I'm very pleased that we have with us today Dr. Richard Schmollensee, who's Dean Emeritus from the MIT Sloan School of Management. He has just completed chairing a policy study for the Transportation Research Board that has to do with the STB, how we regulate in the rail industry. Dr. Schmollensee, please come to the table and thank you for being here. Thank you, Madam Chairman, for the opportunity to testify this morning. Um, I think we will try to set up some slides. Um, I'll be reporting on some of the results, the findings and recommendations of a study that uh, a number of us have just completed with, for the TRB, uh, an arm of the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. The, um, the study was formally released um, 12 minutes ago. It's available on the National Academy's website, and there are uh, uh, summary descriptions at the back of the room. This study was, um, there we go, was requested uh, by Congress in 2005, funded in 2013, and completed, as we said, just a few minutes ago. We were asked to talk about uh, rate and service trends post staggers, particularly since 2000, to look at the performance of the regulatory regime and to make recommendations for the future role of STB. I'm going to focus on the last of these just in the interest of, of being relevant to this hearing. The uh, study process uh, is familiar to those who follow TRB studies. We were briefed by lots of people. We reviewed the literature. We did an unusual amount for one of these committees of statistical analysis of the waybill data, the carload waybill sample, and other data. And of course, we deliberated. Um, one of the key findings, as I said, we were asked to talk about um, uh, events post staggers. And I guess I would summarize our findings in that respect by saying that this is just not the same industry in almost any respect that confronted the authors of, the, uh, of Staggers. Uh, it was being bailed out. It was uh, financially shaky. Um, I think many observers, particularly many economists, thought that when regulation was relaxed, prices would, of course, rise since you had financially distressed firms. In fact, as everyone knows, prices fell dramatically, particularly over the two decades after staggers, because ICC regulation had uh, restricted the industry's ability to innovate. It's restricted its ability to consolidate traffic, to negotiate contracts, to match up with shipper needs, and on and on. So the, the industry became much more efficient. Um, while rates have risen recently, they're still below the levels of the 1980s. This slide mentions one change post-2000 that I want to emphasize that's particularly relevant uh, to today's hearing. The use of contract carriage of non-exempt commodities has risen sharply since the year 2000. 2012 was the latest year for which we have data. Um, and a lot of that has to do with coal. Uh, if you look at on the left, that pie chart shows that in 2000, coal accounted for just about half of the ton miles moving under tariff. By 2012, coal's use of ton miles of coal tr under tariff went from about half of all coal ton miles to just about 5%. So coal traffic shifted rather dramatically over this relatively short period from tariff to contract. That did not happen for what we have there is the total of, of grain, uh, oil seeds, and, and food and kindred. It didn't happen. It's the, about 70% of that traffic by ton miles moved under tariff in 2000, moved under tariff in 2012. Thus, this hearing is particularly relevant because when one considers um, the reasonability of tariff rates, one is increasingly considering 
the reasonability of rates charged to grain, uh, oil seeds, and uh, shippers of food. So I want to focus on the rate relief process um, and our findings and recommendations um, with the background that we're not thinking much about coal anymore. Really, we are thinking about the uh, particular characteristics of these other shippers, grain, oil seeds, and food. The current process, as I think everyone in this room knows, um, has three steps. There is the initial screen based on the uh, uh, relationship of the rate charge, the tariff rate posted, to variable cost as determined by the uniform rail costing system, uh, universally referred to as IRCS. If a rate exceeds that 180% threshold, the next step in the process is an inquiry about whether uh, the market involved is dominated by the carrier at issue. Assuming that hurdle is cleared, there then becomes uh, uh, an inquiry into the reasonableness of the rate using either the standalone cost uh, process, the first process devised, or the simplified SAC or the three benchmark process. Um, it's important here that to note that our committee, as I think uh, m most people, retain uh, the objectives of staggers, which is to have uh, an industry with adequate revenue. Um, that is to say, not uh, to treat it as a public utility, but to treat it as uh, 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 an industry governed by the marketplace, but also to make sure that we respect the staggers' goal of protecting shippers against unreasonable rates, particularly in settings where those rates are driven by market dominance. So our first finding relates to this first step in the process, the 180% of variable cost test. Um, if you read our report, um, this is perhaps the, the point on which the committee felt most strongly that the IRC system uh, attempts to estimate something that is not defined as a matter of economics and thus produces uh, inevitably uh, estimates that are arbitrary and unreliable. It, costs are omitted. Uh, railroads point out that the costs of bearing the risk of uh, shipping hazardous chemicals don't show up uh, on their income statements and thus don't show up in IRCs and it's not a surprise that um, that most hazardous chemicals move at rates above 180, many move at rates above 180 percent of IRCs. Um, determining what's fixed and what's variable and what fraction of a locomotive is variable and what fraction is fixed is essentially arbitrary. Allocating common costs among the traffic involved is inherently arbitrary and we have plenty of examples of that. Um, there are odd features that go beyond arbitrariness, as that second set of uh, bullets indicates. Um, uh, some kinds of traffic, particularly short-haul traffic, have rates systematically above this threshold, above 180 percent of IRC's variable cost. Um, and 20 to 25 percent of traffic, year in and year out, moves at rates that the system says are below variable cost. And that, of course, doesn't make any sense. That's, if you take it literally, that means that railroads are moving 20 to 25 percent of their traffic at an out-of-pocket loss. The key point that we would stress is this can't be fixed in the sense that you can't reform the procedure of deciding what's fixed and what is variable and allocating costs um, among uh, uh, elements of traffic without producing an arbitrary outcome. Now, to step back, it's not hard to see why when Staggers was passed, the, the authors wanted some threshold to determine the eligibility of, of uh, shippers to challenge rates, and 
this was some, you know, you could do it. And if I were sitting in 1980, it's not clear I would have done anything different. But it's not 1980. We now have plenty of rates that are determined under competitive conditions. And those rates we submit can be used as a benchmark. And those rates as a benchmark make more economic sense than essentially arbitrary estimates of variable cost. And I will come back in a moment to how we might do that. The second finding relates to the second uh, uh, step in the current process, and that is the market dominance hearing, or the market dominance assessment. Um, now, we understand why the a board uh, has excluded evidence on um, product and geographic substitutability. That's complicated evidence. But of course, excluding a category of evidence that suggests market dominance is not present is clearly going to bias decisions, and just as an economic or a logical matter. The to that evidence can be difficult to uh, process, of course, but I've done a fair amount of antitrust work over the years, and one observes the Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission dealing with evidence of that complexity routinely and simply in informal proceedings in informal proceedings. In quasi-judicial or judicial proceedings, of course, evidence of this complexity is hard to deal with. In informal proceedings, not that difficult. Time limits, we suggest, ought to replace exclusion of categories of evidence. The, sorry, went past one. All right, I need to go back. Excuse me. Yeah. Manual intervention. Uh, the third, the third um, step in the process is either the standalone cost system or a standalone cost test or one of the simplified procedures introduced later. Uh, our committee suggested, concluded, found that those should be replaced. Um, it's important to understand that given the Staggers Act's enabling of uh, shipper-specific contracts, railroads and shippers have every incentive to move all traffic that can be profitably moved. So that you don't have here the sort of classic monopoly loss problem that you have in regulating electric power or telephone that gee, if the price is too high, there will be too little volume. It's not that loss problem. The regulatory uh, issue here seemed to us to be inherently about fairness. And the standalone cost test embodies one notion of fairness, that if I'm paying more than the standalone cost, then I'm subsidizing somebody else under public utility regulation. The standalone cost test comes out of public utility regulation, comes out of telecom debates, in fact, in the 70s, um, and comes out of a concern that prices too high encourage inefficient entry, not, as we understand it, a live issue in rail today. Um, it seemed to us that the simplified procedure, well, and, and the fact, uh, which this slide doesn't state, but everyone knows, well, it sort of does, that this that the SAC procedure has really not been usable by small shippers, particularly by grain shippers that ship to multiple destinations. Um, maybe one reason why there's less contracting for those shippers, but in any case, the SAC procedure at, we were told, about $5 million a case is not usable by small shippers. The simplified procedures um, are simpler, but they make use of IRCs. And if that's fundamentally flawed, simplifying by making more use of a fundamentally flawed measuring stick uh, is not, we submit, a move in the right direction. So let me say what we suggest be done instead. And I will preface, preface this by saying uh, almost everything I'm about to describe almost certainly requires legislative change. 
um, which is good news or bad news depending on your point of view, but, but our task uh, was not to think about what's feasible but to think about what should be done. So we proposed using the competitively determined rates that I mentioned a few moments ago as benchmarks. The report describes how we do that, but the fundamental notion, again, is, in a, is a fairness notion that it ought to be the case that a shipper in a market dominated by a single railroad shouldn't have to pay a rate that is too far out of line with rates paid by shippers in competitive markets for similar shipments. So we can look at, statistically, we can model the determination of rates in competitive markets uh, uh, as a function of shipment characteristics. We can then ask, what does that model predict for rates in non-competitive markets? And what that graph shows for farm products, as it happens, the, given our data, the, the ratios of actual rates in non-competitive markets to predicted rates in those markets, predicted on the basis of a model of competitively determined rates. Now you will see that a reasonable fraction of the predicted rates are less than the, uh, the actual rates, I'm sorry, are less than the predicted rates. Those are the uh, rates represented by the mass to the left of the vertical line at one. And that's of course because it's a model and doesn't fit data precisely and we don't, we aren't able to precisely uh, uh, predict all competitive rates. That's a worthwhile caution because it says that many of the observations to the right of that line where the actual rate exceeded, exceeds the rate predicted under competition are there simply because the model is, like all models, imperfect. So we wouldn't propose that all of the rates to the right, uh, all of the tariff rates to the right, uh, be treated as uh, su subject to detailed examination, that is to say, um, uh, treated as if they had passed the IRCS test, the 180% test. But the farther out you go, the more likely it is that what's happening is uh, uh, serious use of market power to raise rates. So. Our suggestion is this sort of modeling can be perfected. Our report contains what we consider to be a proof of concept using waybill data and other data that are readily accessible and a lot of work. Two of the members of our committee produced a model of competitive rate setting, applied it to non-competitive markets, um, and such a model can be, can be tested, can be refined, can be debated. But the policy, those are technical questions. The policy question is, what replaces 180? Because 180 is an arbitrary number. There's no economics to it. I assume it was a late night negotiation. Um, uh, to use this approach, one needs to come up with a replacement number to say that rates that are twice the competitive or three times the competitive prediction or one and a half times the competitive prediction or 180 percent of the competitive prediction if you like that uh, are subject to challenge. This approach, so a few points about it, we advocate this to replace the IRCS test and this could not have been done when Staggers was written. There weren't rates that you would say are determined under competition in an efficient rail system. We have such rates now. Uh, the threshold, what replaces 180, uh, it's a policy decision. If you set it too low, you place revenue adequacy at risk. If you set it too high, you uh, risk not granting rate relief to people who ought to get it. Uh, there is no magic number. It's likely to be controversial, but like the determination of 180, it can be transparent. Uh, Appendix B of our report, thanks to a lot of work by two members of our committee, has detailed analysis and a proof of concept 
Uh, it is not the last word, but it suggests you can do this credibly, and we think it's much better than SAC. Um, for the second and third stages, the dominance test, the dominance proceeding before the STB, and the um, standalone cost test for reasonability, if dominance is cleared, um, we propose, again, in the interest of reducing cost um, and proceeding expeditiously and not excluding relevant evidence, we propose moving to arbitration at that point. Um, if the screening tool is appropriate, one doesn't have to rely on stringency at the second and third stages to, to preserve revenue adequacy. Arbitration can be informal. We propose it to be behind closed doors with confidential results so we don't um, uh, set, set precedent. Uh, it can be fast, it can be economical, it can, can consider complex evidence. We propose this be final offer arbitration, best baseball style arbitration, uh, because experience has shown that um, promotes settlement because of uncertainty about the arbitrator's decision. It also present, uh, promotes uh, the parties making reasonable offers because unreasonable offers are unlikely to be accepted. Now, one reason why we uh, have some confidence in the merits of this recommendation is the Canadian experience. Now, this is not to say the Canadian experience is a panacea or we should, we should uh, imitate all aspects of the Canadian experience, but in Canada, a shipper doesn't have to pass any sort of screen to be entitled to arbitration. A shipper can uh, raise its hand, get rate arbitration, get service arbitration even. The Canadian system, uh, as nearly as we can tell, has not involved a lot of cases, even without a screen for eligibility. Most of those have settled. And while nobody likes to be at the mercy of an arbitrator, the system proceeds without $5 million a case costs, and it proceeds in a manner that makes it accessible to small shippers. And it proceeds without the need to exclude evidence in order to move on a timely fashion. So we think dominance does need to be part of the arbitrator's task, but there's no reason why an arbitrator can't, like the antitrust division does, consider complex evidence with a time limit. Um, we also think there is no reason why uh, the kind of cost evidence that would undoubtedly be brought forward in this sort of arbitration uh, can't be considered. Again, the Canadian experience, while not, not perfection and not necessarily something we want to imitate in detail, suggests that this approach is workable and can be done in a timely, expeditious, relatively inexpensive fashion. I, I would mention, since I still have a green light, uh, two other aspects of our proposals, and then of course I would, I would welcome your, your questions. Um, I know you have before you a proposal uh, by Nitley regarding reciprocal switching, and we discussed reciprocal switching in our deliberations. We did not take a position on the Nitley proposal. We, we did observe that, that Canada has reciprocal switching everywhere within, if you're within 20 miles of a switch point, uh, 20 kilometers, I'm sorry. Um, but um, we didn't reach a proposal, we didn't reach a conclusion on uh, that proposal or proposals like it, but it did seem to us, whoa, okay, it, it, it did seem to us that in the context of arbitration, that it would not be unreasonable to allow either side to propose reciprocal switching as part of its final offer. A railroad might say, well, we think our rate is terrific, but if you really think it isn't, we will uh, allow for switching at cer a certain price and let you negotiate with the uh, other uh, railroad at the switch point. Or the shipper might say, um, I, I don't want to rely on you at all. I want switching and I'm willing to pay X for it. Uh, we think 
that if you get to arbitration, it's not unreasonable to have that uh, be part of either party's final offer. Uh, with elimination of the IRCS test, there's no longer a concern that this might lead to a rate below 180 percent of, of variable cost. Um, again, uh, putting it into arbitration and not a blanket nationwide policy um, uh, r removes concerns about uh, fee schedules, distances, and so forth. That would be part of the arbitration. The second point um, up there that is relevant here, of course, it's more relevant to your next hearing, but I'm, I'm here today, and if you will permit me a few moments to uh, just round this out, uh, we recommend eliminating the annual revenue adequacy determinations uh, this described by the board itself as a mechanical process, uh, pass-fail grading. Uh, our reason is twofold. First, the prolonged use of this process that looks on its surface like public utility regulation, we compare the cost of capital to earn the cost of capital, uh, suggests to some on both sides of, of the debate that perhaps there ought to be a cap of some sort based on this kind of uh, comparison of returns with cost of capital. We think that's inconsistent with staggers, we think it's impractical, and we think it's not, uh, not the way forward. The second reason is um, there's good reason why the railroad industry needs to be looked at closely in terms of revenue adequacy, in terms of competitive conditions, in terms of uh, uh, exercise of market power, the annual revenue adequacy determination is not such a look. So our recommendation is that the annual exercise be dropped, but that the board be tasked with periodically, let's say every five years, issuing an in-depth report on competitive conditions, revenue adequacy, long-term prospects, and so forth uh, to assess whether, you know, the, the policy we have is producing the results that we want, um, which I don't think and we don't think the annual revenue adequacy determinations do. With that, I will pause and thank you for your patience. Thank you very much, Professor Schmolensi. I suspect there are lots of people in the audience right now that wish they had the opportunity to ask you questions. And if we could do that, we could probably just spend the rest of the day peppering you. But uh, fortunately for Ann and I, we get the opportunity to ask some questions. And I would say to those of you who are in the room, we did have the opportunity yesterday. Dr. Schmolensi was kind enough to come up and give us a preview of uh, the report, so uh, we have had an opportunity to already ask a few questions, but I certainly find that I come up with other questions every time I hear you go through this analysis. And so just a couple of things I want to clarify. You've talked about the issue of uh, market dominance, not restricting um, categorical um, evidence but using time limits and that that works better in an informal proceeding. And when you talk about informal proceeding, is that another way to say arbitration? Is that really what that means? That's what that means in this context, yes ma'am. Okay. I just wanted to be sure that there weren't other ways you all were thinking about it. And uh, one of the other things that I was wondering, when you talk about SAC, and you say, uh, you know, really the, the purpose was to both, is really more to determine fairness than to efficiency, is one of the reasons why the committee concluded that there's no economic justification for the use of SAC because the analysis is a fairness analysis, not an efficiency analysis? I, I mean, am I, am I drawing too many connections from what you said? Well, it's my, my lack of clarity, I'm afraid. I think. The approach we take um, is fundamentally a fairness approach, as is the SAC approach. Uh, so that's not, you know, if, if you could do SAC inexpensively and quickly, uh, and it could be made uh, uh, accessible to, to small shippers, you could argue, well, okay, this is one definition of fairness. Uh, the comparison with competitive rates that 
we propose is another. Ours is very quick, however, um, and the arbitration is very quick, and an arbitrator will naturally be concerned with issues of fairness. The SAC test is a particular measure of fairness. We could have a long discussion about its properties. Um, it's not obviously the right one here. I can see why it was done uh, when Staggers, after Staggers was passed, when, when confronted with a railroad industry that you know the costs are too high because of the legacy of regulation, then to say, well, let's, let's look at the costs of an efficient alternative that just serves you and we, uh, uh, fairness says you shouldn't be subsidizing other people. Of course, without a rate of return constraint, it's not clear there's a subsidy, but you, you shouldn't be paying more than the standalone cost of an efficient system. That makes a certain amount of sense, but it's, there's no theorem that says that that's the way to do fairness. I, I could see why it happened when Staggers was passed. I think experience has shown that it's unwieldy and not the only way to think about fairness. Certainly it is unwieldy, no question about that. I have a final question, then I'll turn it over to the vice chairman. But I, I want to go back in terms of the issue of revenue adequacy. Again, this is you know maybe my interpretation of what you said. And that is that really where we are 35 years post staggers is that there's no real purpose served by the revenue adequacy test and the approach that's been suggested by your committee of doing more of a five-year in-depth analysis as much as anything is a way to continue to monitor you know, whether or not we're continuing to see, a, you know, a good competitive market, but not really because revenue adequacy is needed in the regulatory process. I mean, again, am I going too far in interpreting the panel's recommendations? No, I don't think you're going too far. I think the, the, the notion that the board should revise its process if the industry is found to be revenue adequate um, uh, which kind of lurks from from earlier statements, uh, I think um, is too mechanical in a way. Uh, nobody looks at, you know, is General Electric revenue adequate this year? I, you look at businesses over the business cycle, you look at long-term prospects, you look at a variety of things in judging the health of an institution. Now, we were not, or uh, an industry, we were not tasked with um, uh, assessing the, the methods used uh, in the annual review. We did have discussions about them. But at, at the end of the day, it seemed to us that what's happened after Staggers, 35 years after Staggers, as the industry has invested and innovated and reinvented itself, is it looks a lot more like a normal industry than it did mm -hmm. with Staggers when Staggers was passed. You could see why you'd want annual revenue adequacy determinations because are we going to have to bail them out again was clearly on people's minds and logically on people's minds given how much had been spent. Um, that's not on anybody's mind today as far as I can tell. The industry is a, a making substantial investments. The industry is, uh, you know, expanding capacity. So the notion of do they have what they need to live? And if they do, maybe we should tighten regulation. Seems counter to the thrust of Staggers at the end of the day. I mean, Staggers was about making this into an ordinary, wholesome, wholesome, healthy, maybe wholesome or not, healthy <laughs> industry. <laughs> healthy industry, we can debate wholesome if you like, but healthy industry that, yeah, still needs regulatory oversight because it has inevitably a fair amount of market power and is an important industry. But, it, but Staggers pointed toward light-handed regulation, not public utility style regulation. And the annual revenue adequacy looked to us a lot like public utility regulation. And a periodic, say, five-year examination of the industry looked a lot like let's inform policy and see if we're in the right direction and do we need to make changes. Uh, it just seemed to serve that that seemed to be the right purpose today. Are we on the right track? Not turn the crank, yes, no, revenue adequate, not revenue adequate.
Thank you very much, Vice Chairman Vega. Yeah, th thank you very much. I, I think uh, you have a lot of people needing some air in the room. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, thank you really the, for getting us sort of out of the group think mentality mm -hmm. that a lot of times we, we get sucked into when we start dealing with these issues and rate case methodologies and the way it's always been done. You know, you, you certainly have made clear that much of what you're suggesting is without, not in our power to do with, without legislation. But one of the questions I wanted to ask is you, you mentioned that because of the, the change in, in coal shipments that you sort of did not include that element in your process as far as what you were developing. But even if you had, would, it, would you have come out with a different outcome? No, um, we would not. I wouldn't say that we excluded them. It was just that we noticed that, you know, almost all coal now travels under contract. Um, my sense is, and I think the sense of the committee, without being able to um, document it, is that one reason why, a couple of reasons why contracting in coal is easier than contracting in grain, but an important reason we suspect is that there were a, all those coal cases which sort of set bounds on what kind of rates might stand up. Uh, that makes negotiation a little easier. Um, we didn't exclude coal from our consideration. Uh, the, the approach we propose would apply as well to coal as to anything else. Um, but coal shippers appear willing to enter into contracts and thus uh, not be eligible for reasonability determination. All right, thank you for correcting my impression because I thought you said that you weren't thinking about coal anymore. That didn't, no, but it no, had a different meaning. No, no ma'am. It, okay. it was just to point out that the, the composition of tariff traffic has changed, right. but what we propose would apply to all tariff traffic. Um, on, on the modeling that you had on the screen for the farm commodities of the, the different pyramid, if you will, right? was that just illustrative or was it actually based on the way bill data? Oh, it was based on the way bill data. It was based on <laughs> the way bill data plus, plus data on, um, and I don't remember the, the name of the database, but it had to do with, provided locational information so that, that we could assess is there barge competition nearby um, and, and so forth. It was based on the, the real way bill data. The, the so it was where the, the traffic was, what was moving, if there was competition, what the distance was. Where yeah, we started with, with um, um, contract or exempt traffic uh, where there was uh, rail competition nearby or barge competition nearby. We treated those as competitive benchmark rates, modeled how they depended on shipment characteristics such as distance, number of car loads, and so on and so forth, and then used that model to say, well, if this other shipment, this tariff shipment without rail competition available, what would that rate have been? if it had been competitive in line with these other competitive rates. And of course, the model's not perfect, can't be perfect, so there's modeling error. Um, but as opposed to IRCS, we're at, least, <laughs> we're at least trying to predict something real, that is to say the competitive rate, not something imaginary like variable cost. So that was based on a rather extensive analysis of the way bill data done by two members of our, of our committee with staff help. Again, we don't, uh, let me be clear, we don't say, Take Appendix B, write it into the legislation, and use it. Uh, the point of Appendix B, which is where the analysis is done, is to say this approach is feasible. It can undoubtedly be done better than we did it, but it's feasible. And as far as sort of the, um, I guess the punchline of arbitration, did you have opinions on whether or not it's something that could be done within the board, or actually it should be outside of the board? Um, we, we, we resisted the usual academic temptation to reorganize the federal government. Uh, we, my understanding is that, again, I'm not a lawyer, nobody involved is, um, but that it would be... That's okay, neither are we. <laughs> I, I'm not sure the it's board... It's a feature, not a flaw. I, I'm not sure the board has the authority to hand off decision-making to an arbitrator. If it did, then it could. If it doesn't, then it can't. But if the parties would agree to it, 
they could. Oh, they if could the parties that. would agree to it, then perhaps it can. Mm -hmm. we, we don't propose mutual agreement to be the test. Mm -hmm. we, we just propose that to be what you do at that point. Um, in the part, you know, that based on prior cases would save an enormous amount of, of um, uh, person hours at the board to be able to do that. Well, I, I guess we're sort of kind of left with trying to fix the unfixable, at least with this proceeding. Thank you for thank you for that. Um, <laughs> but if if you have any ideas on on what we could do, just with our, our you know, we still have we have a mandate, we have an obligation. You you do, and it is a difficult one, and it's a little bit of an unwieldy mandate, which was part of the point that, mm -hmm. that we tried to make. And I wish we'd been able to come up with given your statutory authority, here is the obvious way forward, but um, uh, we didn't impose that constraint on ourselves, and I don't want to make something up here as I sit here. But. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. We appreciate your being mm -hmm. here today. Thank you for, for your time.